Hi there, everyone, and welcome to the Zimmer Biomed Vertebral Body Tethering Webinar. My name is Dave Briggs, and I'll be your commentator. We have a truly exceptional group of faculty to present this evening, but before we begin, one reminder, make sure to make frequent use of the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Thank you for joining us today. And it is my pleasure to introduce Robin Young, editor and publisher of Orthopedics This Week. Robin, the program is yours. Thank you, David, and thanks to all of our attendees tonight. We have two very experienced orthopedic surgeons with us this evening. Dr. Ryan Goodwin from Cleveland Clinic's Children's Hospital and Dr. Daniel Hornschmeyer from University of Missouri Healthcare. Both surgeons are pioneer adopters of vertebral body tethering and support the education and training of new users interested in this newly FDA HDE approved approach for treating adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Dr. Ryan Goodwin is an orthopedist at Cleveland Clinic Children's Hospital where his research and practice interests include scoliosis, spine deformity, pediatric trauma, hip disorders, and clubfoot. He received his medical degree from Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, an MBA from the same institution, and completed a residency and fellowship program at Cleveland Clinic and Children's Hospital in San Diego. He is an active member of AAOS. Dr. Daniel Hornschmeyer is an orthopedist in Columbia, Missouri at the University of Missouri Children's Hospital. His practice and research interests include treating patients with spinal deformity, scoliosis, dwarfism, cerebral palsy, and club foot, among many other genetic disorders. He received his medical degree from the University of Missouri at Kansas City, followed by a residency and fellowship at St. Mary's Spine Center and Johns Hopkins University. He is also an active member of AAOS. Tonight, we will be providing you with an in-depth review of vertebral body tethering and what you need to know about the Tether, the only FDA HDE approved device currently available for use in the United States. Francisco Artiega from Zimmer Biomet will be our moderator this evening. And I'd like to kick things off by handing the program over to Dr. Goodwin, who is going to review indications, contraindications, and provide a procedural overview. Take it away, Dr. Goodwin. Thank you, Robin, and good evening. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Um, my charge here to start is going to be to give sort of a 50,000 foot overview of vertebral body tethering and sort of what it is. Um, hopefully by the time we're done with this portion of the talk, you'll have a better understanding of the, the technique and the thought process behind why it works. So what is vertebral body tethering? Well, it's a novel non-fusion treatment for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Um, and it's indicated for patients who have progressive curves with growth remaining. And I've highlighted that because it's important that patients who undergo this treatment have significant growth remaining. Because this technique really leverages the patient's growth remaining to not only halt progression, but also gain some correction over time. And any successful VBT case um, hopefully should avoid a fusion, uh, which we've been doing for years as the gold standard for uh, definitive treatment of progressive idiopathic scoliosis. It employs this concept of guided growth, which we're all very familiar with as orthopedists. Um, we have been guiding growth in the lower extremities for years very successfully by tethering, if you will, the growth plates on one side of a joint and allowing the other side to grow straight over time. So this concept can be also be applied uh, to the spine in patients with scoliosis as seen here. Here's an example of the, um, the tether device applied in a patient with scoliosis who's, that has corrected over time, much like the young child's legs have corrected um, over time with uh, the uh, O-plate procedure. Here is a uh, sort of a cartoon video describing how the vertebral body tethering uh, technique is, is performed. Um, it's performed in the lateral position through a thoracoscopy. So there are small portals and it's a minimally invasive procedure. Um, and once the portals have been established, the tether implants, which are a combination of a staple and screw device, along with a tether cord are applied to the convex side of the patient's spine, as you see here. And as the tether is applied, there's sequential tension is applied to the cord to help 
um, provide some correction initially on the operating table. And then over time, uh, as the patient continues to grow, the concavity will continue to grow while the convexity stays where the tether device is holding it. Um, so that's sort of the concept and how vertebral body tethering works. Now, what are the indications for it? Uh, you know, these are, again, patients with progressive curves between 35 and 65 degrees. And again, as I mentioned, they have to have growth remaining or this technique doesn't work. So that means they ought to have a wrist or two to three or less or, or a Sanders five or less based on Sanders um, uh, wrist for bone age classification, which is probably we find more accurate for predicting growth remaining in children. So Sanders three is probably sort of the, the sweet spot for this, but the true indications are under five uh, or five or less. And again, the patient has to have idiopathic scoliosis. This is a procedure that uh, is not indicated for neuromuscular curves, patients with cerebral palsy, congenital scoliosis, uh, or any syndrome associated scoliosis. So it's important that these are all patients with idiopathic scoliosis. I'll spend a couple of minutes talking about the actual technique. Again, very high level for this. Um, it's done with the patient in a lateral decubitus position with the convex side up. Um, the anesthesia team will use a dual lumen endotracheal tube so they can deflate the uh, up lung so there's room to work in the patient's chest cavity. Uh, and the portals are marked. You can see here it's an minimally invasive procedure. So the portals are marked um, using either C-arm imaging or uh, O-arm imaging, which is my preference. Uh, it gives us a, a good idea in three dimension where the portals need to go so that we can access the spine safely uh, in a minimally invasive fashion. And as I mentioned, it's a thoracoscopic procedure. So the patients uh, have to tolerate single lung ventilation uh, and the anesthesia team has to deliver this for us. Uh, and the, some surgeons will use a, an access surgeon for the thoracoscopy portion. Uh, other orthopedic surgeons do prefer to do it, um, their own thoracoscopy, uh, which is my preference because I was, I was fortunate to have training in this area. Uh, and again, patients are on single lung and you can see here this setup with the C-arm across the table with uh, the monitors next to each other for the thoracoscope uh, here as well as the CR. Uh, inside the chest, once the spine has been identified and we've localized the levels to instrument, we prepare the levels by cauterizing the segmental vessels uh, directly over the vertebral bodies that we're going to instrument. Uh, and this again can be verified under image. Uh, and we want to avoid the discs if at all possible. Again, we're trying to preserve motion. So much like avoiding joints, uh, we'll avoid the discs and try to not to disrupt their architecture. Once the uh, vertebral bodies are prepared, we will use those thoracoscopic portals to apply the instrumentation by looking both through the, the thoracoscope as well as fluoroscopy. Um, it's, it's, this is kind of what it looks like when doing that. Um, in, at each level, there is a staple in the screw that's placed and the staple helps to um, avoid plowing of the screw. So at each level, it's going to be instrumented. The staple and screw are placed uh, and check both thoracoscopically and under image intensification. Um, and then once all the screws are in good position, we apply this, the tether cord um, sequentially, either from proximal to distal or distal to proximal, whatever the surgeon's choice is. Uh, uh, tension can be applied to this tether cord in varying levels to uh, provide the, the desired effect. Uh, and again, this is all done thoracoscopically with um, all done thoracoscopically with um, usually four or five, maybe six incisions. Um, patients are in the hospital for a day or two and we restrict their activities for uh, about six weeks time, which allows for chest wall healing and allows for integration of the um, hydroxyapatite coating on the implants. And we usually follow them along with films about every six months uh, until skeletal maturity and then annually after that. So here's that patient I just showed at the beginning of the case as she continues to grow uh, with her tethered device. So that's a nice uh, overview, hopefully, of the VBT procedure and how it's accomplished. And I will send it back to Chico. Thank you, Dr. Goodwin. That was a great introduction of vertebral body tethering. 
Our next presenter, Dr. Daniel Hornschmeyer, will review patient selection and how vertebral body tethering works to reverse adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. So uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, so I'm going to share with you guys just some thoughts on patient selection and how uh, important really this is when uh, trying to apply, uh, apply a new technology uh, to your practice. And so uh, you know, vertebral body tethering uh, and trying to figure out what our selective uh, intended uh, uh, treatment group really is uh, for, for this procedure. Um, and so, yeah, so, so when, you, when we kind of look at, uh, there are so many questions that uh, we started out with uh, originally with uh, VBT, you know, who was our group, uh, what was going to be our uh, mechanism, uh, when should this procedure be done, uh, where should it be done, and how much should we be treating and all the technical considerations. And so when we think about our intended uh, treatment group, um, we need to uh, best define that. And with uh, some of the work that was done up at uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, uh, this was a published uh, uh, manuscript uh, just last year. And what this looked at was really applying the uh, FDA indications uh, that, that were out there for uh, VBT and really looking at the patient population that they had treated from 2016 to 2019 um, for uh, operative scoliosis. And what they found was really, uh, it was a small subset of their patient population. It was really only about 21% uh, of these patients. And so they, they listed a number of patients that uh, are, are non-qualifiers, non-candidates, uh, for the VBT procedure. And I think some of these were starting to kind of push the limits, whether they're larger uh, thoracic curves, uh, larger lumbar curves, uh, and we're starting to get more comfortable as we push those edges. Uh, but that was really the uh, first uh, you know, stab at, at, at what the intended treatment group. When you think about uh, the indications for VBT and what makes uh, somebody an ideal candidate, you really can kind of break it down into the, the Cobb angle, the skeletal maturity, uh, and uh, the curve flexibility. And when we have a 20 degree curve that's quite flexible, we're often thinking about our first line of treatment being bracing. When we have a very rigid 60 degree curve in a very mature patient, then we're considering more of the posterior spinal fusion, which has been the gold standard for, for decades. But really, when we think about VBT, we really have to have this flexibility and some continued growth uh, in order to get that uh, mod you know, modulation of the spine. And uh, so this speaks really to the window of opportunity uh, that we have with uh, VBT for our patients. So when I think about ideal patients uh, considering age, the youngest that's been documented has been eight years of age, and that was in a report by Dr. Lenke back in 2010. I think if you look on average in the literature, it's about 11 to 13 um, on average for these patients. The younger patients, uh, the concerns there are that they will overcorrect uh, if you treat them too early or too aggressively with the tensioning. Younger patients are, can be too small for implants, and we like for them to grow so their chest cavity uh, can accommodate uh, the implants. And single lung ventilation sometimes cannot be performed uh, when the children are, are too young. So that's a concern on the younger side and then the older age, simply just not having enough uh, growth there to, to modulate with VBT. And so here you see a few of the early papers that were really defining uh, some of the indications uh, for VBT. And it really shows you the age range you know, Sanders uh, 2.5 to 4.3, uh, Risser 0 to 2, uh, and the Cobb angles were in the 40s and 50s. Uh, but this really helps us to define uh, some of these uh, indications and seeing what the success rates are uh, in each of these areas. And so when you consider, uh, that was more to address our intended treatment group, but now you need to consider really uh, when this should be done. And so predicting these models of growth are so important uh, when you're trying to find that window of opportunity for VBT. 
the things that we tend to follow are triradiate cartilage uh, and whether this is open or closed to help us better understand where a child's at with their peak height velocity. Uh, the RISR sign that's been around since 1953 when it was first described to really give us a sense of where a child's at with their skeletal maturity. Um, and then Sanders staging, uh, which is more recent. And it really defines uh, whether a child's uh, immature, uh, right in their uh, peak height velocity uh, or reaching skeletal maturity, depending on where their growth plates are in the hand. And so uh, Jim Sanders did a nice job of breaking this down uh, in stage one through eight in the ideal stages for vertebral body tethering really are at stage two, stage three, and stage four. Now, there have been some reported cases at stage five and, and later, uh, but I think the kids that we worry about overcorrecting are really in stage two, uh, and the kids that we really see very little correction thereafter is uh, the stage uh, four patients. So, so it really kind of describes uh, where we want to uh, you know, treat these kids on their hand x-ray. Here you see a patient uh, who has a Sanders three uh, on their hand x-ray. And what this really shows us, this is the swan neck uh, graph that uh, Jim likes to describe, but really how things kind of come together uh, and we really understand where that patient is to be about 90 to 95% of their final adult height. And so when you get to those later stages of a Sanders seven or Sanders eight, really just how little of growth is really taking place uh, on those final uh, stages. And so we broke this down then into, uh, you know, really a, a nice chart that kind of laid out the high risk patients. And when we think about the kids that are real ideal for vertebral body tethering, uh, then we're really thinking about uh, this lower uh, inferior uh, quadrant uh, that are, very skeletally immature with uh, higher curves and they have a high risk of progression. And so we need curve flexibility to be an ideal candidate as well. Curves have to bend down less than 30 degrees. And on the coronal and sagittal plane, as Ryan spoke to, uh, you know, there's uh, some indications there put out by the FDA. And we know that our success rate drops once it gets uh, in that 60 to 80 range. Uh, of down to 36%. Uh, hypokyphosis is ideal, but uh, the hyperkyphotic uh, patients uh, are a concern. And when you look at lanky curve patterns, uh, much has been described in the lanky 1As and 1Bs. Uh, I think when you look at uh, lanky 1Cs, whether you're doing a selective versus a double tether, as you see here, uh, those are really uh, treatment decisions that need to be considered. Uh, an ideal uh, patients can be sex successfully treated uh, with linky 2As uh, if they're immature enough. Uh, and then the others that are treated uh, quite successfully are linky 5s. Uh, but we have to worry and uh, there's much to understand about tethering in the lumbar spine and the motion there. So, um, and then as we tether uh, double uh, curves as uh, linky 6s, this becomes again, much less uh, predictable of an event. And so in our study, uh, we, we really looked at 31 uh, patients trying to understand uh, where uh, kids were at with their skeletal uh, maturity and trying to identify the best patients uh, possible. In these 31, we had three that were uh, lost to follow up. And when we were able to break that down, 27 patients reached uh, skeletal maturity. Of these 27 patients, uh, 20 of them uh, then went on uh, to really uh, maintain their curve under 30 degrees. So we had 74% uh, success rate. And so again, uh, clinical success, at least in our hands, was about 74%. The revision rate, about 21%. Um, and broken tethers, about 48%. Uh, but when we look at these various curve patterns, that's what we were hoping to describe in our, our paper. And 93% of the patients avoided a posterior spinal fusion. So in the discussion, the best candidates uh, for VBT are probably lanky 1As, 1Bs, 1Cs, 2s, 3s, and 5s. 
uh, with a Sanders stage of three to five and a Cobb angle somewhere between 45 and 70. Uh, and if you follow this criteria, which was seen in 20 of our patients, we did have some that were skeletally mature. We hit a 75% success rate. Uh, but we did see some successes in the older skeletally mature patients as long as they did not break a tether. So in conclusion, again, average age, uh, 10 to 13 uh, growth remaining, two to four on the Sanders scale is ideal. Uh, lanky ones uh, are ideal, um, you know, single thoracic curves to be treated, but uh, others are, are certainly uh, treatable as well. And in curve magnitude, uh, 35 to 65 is what we've kind of outlined, uh, but you can be uh, as successful as you see here with a 74 degree curve that modulates down uh, quite nicely. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hornschmeyer. Now let's take a look at the literature on motion preservation. Back to you, Dr. Goodwin. I, I'm going just to share a couple slides on, you know, safety and efficacy or one on that, and then a couple of uh, slides on our, whether or not we are actually preserving motion since that's one of the things we're aiming to do with VBT. Um, this paper uh, very nicely mirrors the findings from Dr. Horschmeyer and his group. Um, and this was recently published last December. Um, Drs. Uh, Mianji and uh, Parant, they took their 55, sorry, 57 sequential patients. Um, and you can see the mean age is very similar at 12.7 years, 95% female. Um, and they found uh, clinical success in about 77% of their patients. So it's very, very similar findings. Uh, and they define success as a curve less than 35 degrees of maturity. Um, and I think the rationale there, whether it's 30 or 35 degrees, is that if a patient can get to skeletal maturity with a curve that is of a magnitude that would have a benign natural history, um, I think that's one of the ways we can define success here. So if a patient had a 35 degree curve with no operation, um, you wouldn't operate on them. So that's a nice way to uh, sort of identify success. They noted complications in about 28% of their patients and reoperations in about 16%. So again, similar, um, similar findings. And, and they concluded that, you know, VBT does provide a satisfactory deformity correction and what they defined as acceptable complication rates. And now a little bit about motion. Um, there is not a, a ton. We're starting to grow that body of literature. Uh, this paper recently came out from uh, Noelle Larson and her group at Mayo Clinic, and they looked at uh, flexibility x-rays in patients with thoracic tether constructs one year post-op. They did side bending x-rays, uh, and then they did flexion extension x-rays. And they found that on the side bending x-rays, on average, there was about a seven degree coronal arc of motion in the tethered segments. Um, so all those, the levels that were instrumented did show motion of about on average seven degrees. So some, but not a lot there. On the flexion extension films, however, uh, there seemed to be much more motion, a greater arc of motion of 21 degrees on average with flexion and extension. And again, this is over the tethered segments, the instrumented segments. So their conclusion was, yes, we are preserving motion uh, and the motion that's preserved with VBT is probably best in the sagittal plane. Uh, but more to come on this. Um, we postulate that perhaps the sagittal motion might be a more important um, a plane of motion as we people bend over to do things or perform their sports or other daily activities. Um, and finally, this, this paper is also a recent paper, uh, but it was a comparison of VBT patients to fusion patients in the thoracal lumbar spine. So these are lanky five curves from uh, T10 or 11 is the uppermost vertebra and L3 is the lowermost. Uh, and there were two groups of about 20 patients in each one. Um, in looking at the fusions versus the tether patients, the tether patients all had greater range of motion on their x-rays, as you would expect if they had any motion. They had greater trunk strength and they also had higher health reported quality of life um, outcome measures on the SRS forum as well as the SF36. So their conclusion that motion, again, indeed can be preserved with this and the, the consequences, I should say, not complications of fusion can be avoided uh, in these patients with tether. 
Um, so that's just a brief overview of how we're preserving motion and hopefully there'll be more to come. Um, I'm sure there will be in the upcoming years. Thank you, Dr. Goodwin. That was a great presentation. Next, uh, Dr. Hornschmeyer will review, Dr. Hornschmeyer will review the short-term data that's been collected and a summary of the early literature. Dr. Hornschmeyer, the mic is yours. So what I have prepared here is a little bit on uh, a little bit more of the data uh, that's uh, continuing to evolve, and and uh, as as Ryan was showing, there's uh, really been an explosion uh, of data uh, and, and manuscripts and publications really in 2021. Uh, and that's, that's great to see because everybody's wanting to study this and, and better understand that, whether it's a motion analysis, a MRI study, like I'll talk to you guys about today, um, or simply measuring success rates and, and uh, you know, revision surgeries. So, um, so there's, there's quite a bit of that that's uh, continuing to, to evolve and develop. So at this point, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the pathoanatomy uh, behind idiopathic scoliosis and, and really how this develops and, and whether we can really reverse this uh, with VBT. And so scoliosis is, is typically not a problem in four-legged animals. But why humans? Well, humans are unique in both posture and locomotion. So, um, and I love this work uh, by Rene Castanelon uh, and his team out of Utrecht. Uh, and this is from his 2015 article where he reported really no difference when you look at the spinal architecture of a human or other mammals. Um, we, we all have uh, broad vertebral end plates and, and, and discs and posterior facet joints. Uh, that, to withstand our axial loading. But what makes humans unique um, is that we are upright in our posture and we have uh, different uh, uh, spinal pelvic alignment, the lordosis, uh, if you will, in our lumbar spine. Uh, and this places the human trunk over our pelvis instead of in an anterior position like other mammals, like you see here pictured. Uh, and this allows us for a different type of locomotion. Uh, extension of both our hips and knees. When, what, what results from this is really just a posterior sort of sheer loading of the spine, as you see uh, depicted in the upper left-hand side of my slide. And when this happens, uh, we get this uh, decrease in rotational stiffness uh, of the spine. And when this occurs, we really... Um, are starting to then see the process of the heuter volkmann principle. So these, these growth plates in the uh, lower right-hand corner, these uh, neural central synchondroses, these growth plates, start to see differentials in, in pressure. Uh, and then you start to see uh, that growth change and really the, uh, the heuter volkmann principle is, is, is alive and well there. Um, and we certainly see differences too um, in these, uh, in, in both male and females, when we look at their pre-adolescent alignments, they're completely different. And so maybe that's why we see this process more, more in females. And so when you see this spine that develops out of uh, the plane of rotation, then we start to see uh, just the convex muscles that no longer kind of restore our posture. And then joint contractures begin to develop on the concavity uh, and then the nucleus pulposus, uh, which is in the center, uh, starts to shift towards the convexity, causing this differential really of uh, pressures uh, across our end plates, our growth plates, if you will. And uh, this is really all uh, done in the soft tissues. You know, when you think about it, it's a soft tissue disease first, and then it becomes a bony disease. And, um, and so this concavity growth inhibition occurs uh, while it stimulates on the convexity. And then we start to see the bone wedging uh, that really occurs in the pathoanatomy of AIS. And so when you look at VBT, highlighted in red here is, is really where I think we can have an impact on altering that uh, pathoanatomy and the steps that I just listed. So the real question here is, can we reverse this pathoanatomy uh, in AIS? 
Uh, and in our manuscript, which was recently accepted to European Spine Journal just last week to add to that uh, 2021 total of uh, VVT manuscripts, we looked at the health of the spine, the discs and the facets uh, with MRI on a small, small portion of our patients uh, that had undergone VVT. And so this was funded uh, by SRS, looking at two-year follow-up, uh, really, of our MRIs. And this broke down. We looked at things like the nucleus pulposus, uh, the multifidus muscles, uh, the disc degeneration that was occurring, and any development uh, of, of our, uh, osteoarthritis in our facets. And what we really concluded, uh, that in really four of our patients, uh, we did see a shift of the nucleus pulposus towards the midline at three or more vertebral levels, uh, mostly in the tethered segment. So that helps to then start to create that growth modulation. Uh, we really observed no real changes in the fat atrophy of the multifidus uh, or surrounding muscles. Uh, but we really did not see any degenerative changes within the discs in the tethered or the untethered part of the spine. Um, we did see some mild uh, facet osteoarthritis, but that did exist preoperatively that we saw postoperatively. So there wasn't really a big change there. And in one patient, we did have some moderate facet arthritis uh, in a non-adjacent segment, uh, which was L5S1. So uh, so we saw these changes, uh, but probably uh, not a big impact from the VBT, so no adjacent segment disease. So when we can conclude, we can feel that VBT does not really result in a whole lot of degenerative changes, whether it's at the disc or the facet level, um, and that there's really, um, um, again, uh, no, no schmorl's nose, no inflated edema uh, that we're seeing on these two-year MRIs. And while we didn't really see a big uh, predictable change uh, of the nucleus uh, or the multifidus muscle, some of these changes are occurring. But this technique, uh, in our conclusion, take-home message was that uh, the VBT technique may preserve uh, normal post-operative post spinal anatomy. And I think that's a big thing because as we are preserving motion, uh, what more important than to have normal spinal anatomy? So. Here you see a patient of mine, a uh, 12-year-old, Sanders 3. Um, she had about a 45-degree, 44-degree curve. And where that lines her up really uh, is down here, uh, Sanders 3, risk of going uh, to 50%. We know she's high risk uh, of, of, of progressing. So she had the flexibility for uh, the tethering procedure. And when we talked to her, uh, and this is her postoperatively, maybe not at her first post-op, but you can just see that normal spinal rhythm that develops for so many of our patients uh, that we feel so good about. So she was down to about eight degrees uh, post-op. And over the course of the next 12 months, she progressed with her hand x-rays, her skeletal maturation, uh, really down nicely to about two degrees. Here she is at three degree, uh, three years post-op at uh, at 10 degrees, and then most recently at five years, she's a Sanders eight, really no broken tethers. We feel like she's uh, rather successful. And she probably did have a little bounce back uh, of her, uh, of her uh, deformity, um, that rebound that we sometimes see. But here she is at her most recent uh, follow-up, uh, well corrected on her clinical uh, exam. But the most impressive thing was that we had performed an MRI uh, at five years. And what you can see here is that she has a very normal uh, appearing uh, um, discs, no disc degeneration in both her tethered and her untethered segments. Uh, so no adjacent segment disease, no facet joint arthritis. And I think that is so important uh, to the outlook of, of where VBT is going. Um, you know, with our soft tissues. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hornschmeyer and Dr. Goodwin for that literature review and glimpse of what we might expect to see published in the near future. And congratulations to Dr. Hornschmeyer on that recently accepted manuscript. As more patients and their guardians become educated on this new procedure, you, the surgeon in the audience, may find your patients asking more questions or want to know where they can continue their research or even locate a tether-trained surgeon provider in their territory. 
Dr. Goodwin is going to talk now about some of those resources available to your patients. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how patients are becoming aware of VBT and how they access care uh, and how they find information uh, about this uh, relatively new technology and procedure. Um, and as you might expect, patients can access information in a number of ways and find their ways to treating surgeons also a number of different ways. Um, most commonly, probably still, although we don't know, is, are the traditional pathways and local referrals, word of mouth in, in regions where there are specific referral patterns. There's also a fair amount of advertising that gets done, uh, both by healthcare systems and providers, as well as industry. And I'll talk a little bit about social media too, because it is exceptionally prevalent um, in our world and pretty much everybody's got a phone in their hand all the time. Um, first of all, I'll just talk about traditional pathways um, of primary care doc referrals, local or regional referral bases. So if your child is going to the primary care doctor and they are screened for scoliosis and they have scoliosis, they get referred to whomever. Um, and in the community where there is someone who is doing this procedure, they may end up in your office. So if they end up in my office or Dr. Hornsmeyer's office and BBT is something to discuss, then they'll have access to that. And it's really sort of the same for any scoliosis care referral. And there are going to be different patterns regionally, um, nationally, or throughout the continent, uh, throughout the world, probably. So um, that is one very classic traditional way patients are going to access care and learn about BBT. As I mentioned, there's a lot of advertising that happens too. So this can be done by multiple different parties. Uh, certainly healthcare systems uh, who are performing the procedure have providers who are doing this uh, will provide some sort of advertising on the website. Perhaps they'll have some specific advertising on other media formats such as television, radio, whatever. But most of it, I think, is probably web-based at this point based on cost. You can see here, one of the I took a screenshot of one of the one of our hospitals at, at Cleveland Clinic's uh, website for this. Um, not really advertising, but um, information uh, from societies, I think is very helpful. And I, I refer patients to the SRS and POSNA websites quite frequently uh, for information on scoliosis as well as procedures, because it's all the information there in those societies is based on science. Uh, so I think it's a nice, a uh, landing spot uh, or a portal for patients and families to go and get uh, good unbiased information. Um, not that all industry uh, information is biased because it's not. And in fact, um, the myscoliosis.com website is a wonderful landing spot for um, pretty much anyone, patients, surgeons, uh, anyone who wants to learn more about uh, VBT uh, and scoliosis for that matter. Um, and I've blown that up here because if, if you were to sort of drive around this website yourself, you, if you are a patient looking for a surgeon, there's a surgeon locator. They talk about insurance coverage. Um, if you're a surgeon, there's a whole breakdown here in the website on different types of information that someone who is a surgeon would want to know, uh, whether it's about training or learning about the technique. Um, and it's all nicely done. Uh, so patients are accessing information this way as our um, physicians. Uh, and finally, social media and it's capitalized because it is everywhere. And I would contend that the, the vast majority of VBT, you know, customers and air quotes are on social media and a customer could be any of those people. It could be the patient, the patient's family, surgeons, whomever. Um, and there are multiple platforms that are available that are of very little cost. So people use them with some frequency. And again, uh, Everyone's got their phone in their hand. I mean, mine's sitting right here by the, by the desk. Um, and it, it, the information is literally at your fingertips. Um, and there's also support groups. Uh, for example, Facebook probably has the greatest VBT support group. Uh, so patients and families can exchange information and tell about their experiences with certain hospital system surgeons or just share information about what it was like recovering from their child or if they have other questions. So they can exchange information that way. Uh, and I think that can happen on any of these platforms. And also there can be information distributed by uh, the individual physicians who are VBT surgeons or hospital systems. You can see down here a couple of screenshots from um, one of my uh, social media platforms. Um, 
or just others. This says the middle one here is the our hospital uh, retweeting somebody uh, who about one of our VBT patients. And even YouTube, that um, you can post a YouTube video for just about anything. And there's a ton of information on uh, YouTube available for patients as well. Uh, even on the professional sites like LinkedIn and Doximity, there's there's information about uh, VBT that is just exploding in the amount that's available. So I would conclude that you know, patients get VBT access and information um, through all those, all those ways. There's a lot of different ways, traditional pathways that we discussed from referrals. There's advertising that may get their interest. Certainly there's good information from our society, uh, media, our websites. And of course, social media is, is ubiquitous. Um, and it's constantly evolving. And I'm sure um, this will probably be studied at some point in time as to how patients are indeed accessing their information as well as connecting with providers for VBT. Thank you, Dr. Goodwin. That was a great presentation on resources available to our audience and their patients. I'd like to now take a few minutes with each of our faculty uh, discussing how they personally define success in this procedure and possibly even share key aspects of the conversation they have with their patients prior to surgery. Let's start with Dr. Hornschmeyer. Thanks, Chico. Um, so really, when I started to look back on how you define success, this is really you know, an interesting topic because it's how your patients define success and really how do we as surgeons uh, really uh, define success? Uh, is this something that it's on x-ray or is it on clinical exam, right? And, um, and so as surgeons, I think we tend to get, you know, very uh, focused on our x-rays. We know it when we see it and it's a success. I, I know when I was looking at Ryan's uh, x-rays. And, uh, and so we, we tend to um, measure Cobb angles. Uh, and, and, you know, as a study group, you know, we're trying to look at, you know, whether this something is an ideal, satisfactory, uh, or poor outcome, you know, when we look at uh, successes. You know, from the patient's perspective, you know, what, what means the most to them? Is it cosmesis? Is it uh, their flexibility? And so we're trying to look at that, uh, really trying to break down uh, a set of patients with fusions and tethers and interview them and really ask them the questions uh, to break out how they really, really kind of arrived at their uh, decision making, what was important to them, uh, what has you know, is, is, are there different things that are satis more satisfying or dissatisfying about either of those two procedures uh, and, and really understanding what success means to our patients. So I think we're, I think there's more to come really on, on that topic. Great discussion points. Thank you, Dr. Hornschmeyer. Dr. Goodwin, same question for you. How do you define success with this procedure? You know, I think those were all great points that, that Dan made and success can be a lot of things for a lot of different people. From, from a, a surgeon perspective, uh, one of my mentors once said he wanted to define success by, would you do it again? Did you, are you happy you did it? And would you have a family member do it? So that's one way that, that, that patients and families can sort of wrap their hands around, was it successful for them? Um, I've always been of the mindset, if we're gonna have to do some sort of surgical intervention for a patient, I would love it for, for it to be one intervention and be done. So if I can accomplish that with a VBT for someone who's got progressive scoliosis, um, I can have a conversation with the patient and say that 77% of the time, or roughly three quarters of the time, if the patient fits the criteria, they're gonna have that success with one operation. Um, and then, you know, obviously from a surgeon's perspective, if, you, if we can create a condition where the patient has one intervention, and by the time they're done growing, they've got a condition that has a benign natural history, i.e. 35 degree curve or less, um, that they ought to do well. I think that's also successful. Um, and it's important to, to talk to the patients. And I, when I have the preoperative discussions, the fusion always comes up because that's the gold standard and what we're comparing things to. And quite frankly, we have a lot more power uh, for cosmetic correction with fusion than we do with VBT. Uh, so if that's important to patients, they need to understand that and know, and I've had some select out of it for that reason. Um, so I think that's sort of a, in a nutshell, if that's a nutshell, uh, how I would define success for these patients. Excellent. Thank you both for your informative presentations tonight on vertebral body tethering. 
Now I'd like to open it up to our audience to answer any questions they may have. Audience members, please submit any questions you have for our panel via the question and answer button on your screen. For questions tonight, we have Dr. Daniel Hornschmeyer and guest moderator, Dr. Amr Samdani from the Shriners Hospital for Children in Philadelphia. Our first question tonight will be directed to Dr. Hornschmeyer. Dr. Hornschmeyer, when may a patient return to school and physical activities after VBT surgery? And what limitations do you recommend? Well, thank you, Chico. As far as uh, activities uh, and return to school, I think generally uh, most of our patients probably average about four weeks uh, returning to, to uh, school. And then, you know, when we look at activities, I've probably been a little bit on the conservative side listening to Ryan. He returns his kids at six weeks. Uh, we generally uh, return to activities whether that's gymnastics uh, or volleyball, generally around 12 weeks. But uh, I think as we learn more about this procedure, we can become uh, less conservative uh, in, in letting these kids go back uh, a little bit sooner. Great information. Thank you, Dr. Hornschmeyer. This next question will be directed to both of our panelists, starting with Dr. Sundani. Dr. Sundani. What do you view as the greatest patient benefit of this procedure versus posterior spinal fusion? Yeah, so, you know, I'd say that the biggest benefit is going to be motion preservation. You know, if you can imagine, if you have a curvature in your back uh, and you put rods in, you're gonna make that spine look very straight. And certainly on an X-ray, it's going to look uh, very acceptable. But we recognize that those uh, rods, you're going to have some degree of loss of motion, whether, you know, it's a lot, i.e. you're extending into the lumbar spine, or at least it's some when you're in the thoracic spine. So I would say that uh, the biggest advantage, and, you know, we're doing a bunch of motion analysis uh, work at our hospital, and it clearly shows when you fuse someone and you compare that same level of fusion to someone that you're tethering, the tethering patient will have more motion. And that difference in motion increases as you go lower down into their lumbar spine. Great. Now to Dr. Hornschmeyer. The question was, what do you view as the greatest patient benefit of this procedure versus posterior spinal fusion? Well, I'd have to certainly echo what uh, Amr has shared with you guys. Uh, the preservation of motion is, is is so important uh, and so much greater uh, when we can, uh, you know, perform a VBT procedure instead of a fusion. And, and now we're starting to really understand what that means, uh, you know, on the MRI studies, uh, really with the preservation of, of anatomy and, and avoiding things like uh, adjacent segment disease. And so that's so reflective too, uh, when we look at the um, return to activity levels. And I believe there was uh, a quoted uh, number of like 94, 95% uh, return to activities, the same activities uh, after VBT. And that's quite a bit lower uh, when we look at our fusion population. Excellent. Great responses. Thank you both. The next question relates to FDA approval. Dr. Sundani, the Tether has FDA HDE approval. What exactly does humanitarian device exemption mean? Yeah, and you know, just want to make sure I get this in. Uh, both Ryan and Dan, those were phenomenal talks. I mean, I really cutting edge and, and I learned a ton. So just wanted to make sure I put that out there. But with respect to the uh, humanitarian device exemption, the HDE, it is a full product approval. Um, basically, the device ends up demonstrating probable benefits. So there isn't uh, the definitive efficacy of the device that's been uh, demonstrated. It's for a targeted audience, uh, less than 8,000 patients with that condition uh, per year. And then of course the uh, HDE allows a company to legally market and educate surgeons on the device, which is of course very important to its eventual uh, safe uh, usage. But there are some requirements. Uh, it requires that surgeons and institutions that are utilizing the device have an IRB, an institutional review board, review their protocols. It's actually fairly straightforward uh, to, to, to go ahead and get done. And then of course, there has to be 
a very detailed uh, reporting of significant adverse events as well to the local IRB. And then there's some more serious ones that would be reported to the FDA. Great, thank you for that. So if we don't have any more questions from our audience or any other, uh, any other uh, feedback from our faculty presenters tonight, I can close with this. Thank you very much to our surgeon, uh, our surgeon panelists and moderators tonight. Um, without you, we couldn't have this uh, vertebral body tethering uh, masterclass. As we close tonight, please remain online for a short animation of the tether procedure. Thank you. Oh, actually, we do have a question from the audience, if that's okay. So that question is, what are the revision strategies for a broken tether or screw pullout? I'll offer this to you, Dr. Hornschmeyer. Uh, screw, screw pullout. So, uh, in revision strategies, well, anytime uh, you approach uh, with revision strategies, you always want to bring a friend. Uh, we, um, we have an exposure surgeon at our institution. And so I think that's so important as you're working uh, around uh, some of the scar tissue uh, and getting that uh, re-exposure, uh, whether it's a revision of the tether or sometimes we're just removing it uh, because of, uh, of overcorrection. So I think when you look at screw pullout, um, we uh, sometimes will upsize to another screw uh, if we're seeing that, otherwise, uh, as we're tensioning it, uh, just um, uh, providing some downward pressure, uh, providing the tension uh, to kind of prevent that. So, so the, the plow and screw um, uh, upsizing to another screw might be an option. Uh, and, and I guess if that's, uh, if it's necessary, sometimes even skipping, skipping a level uh, if there's uh, too much of a bony defect. Great. Dr. Sumdani, do you have anything to add to that question? I think Dan did a very nice job of just uh, covering, uh, you know, how we handle revisions. I think it's very important to have an access surgeon, uh, you know, or another experienced surgeon on board and uh, really want to, you know, when you're trying to decide what the best uh, treatment is going to be for that uh, broken tether or overcorrection, really have to look at how much growth the child has left and uh, how much uh, deformity that breakage may be causing because many times it'll be asymptomatic. Great. Well, thank you both to our faculty panelists tonight. I don't see any more questions in the uh, question and answer queue. Uh, so at this time, just a reminder, um, for those in the audience, please remain online for a short video animation of the tether procedure. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you to all of our speakers today for an excellent program. And most importantly, thank you to all of our attendees for participating in this evening's program. On behalf of our sponsor, Zimmer Biomed, and today's faculty, be safe and stay well.